Welcome to Charged Up Studio Live, where small business owners get charged up for success. Are you a small business owner? Do you find yourself struggling through the many responsibilities that come with the title entrepreneur? Well, we're here for you. Charged Up Studio is hosted by Market Academy LLC, your prescription for what we call OPA. What is OPA? It's when you become so overwhelmed with the confusion that comes with business ownership that you become paralyzed and ultimately avoid doing anything in hopes it will take care of itself or you put it off till later. Does that sound familiar? I'm your host, Dan Olivo, and each week we bring a business professional eager to charge you up as they talk about the many things that keep you from moving forward with your small business. So are you ready to get charged up for success? Let's hit it. So welcome back to Charged Up Studio, where we uncover the hidden gems of business success and learn from industry experts. I'm Dan Olivo, your host, and today we're continuing our session five monthly focus on the art of entrepreneurial responsibility for small businesses. Successful businesses often provide hints or patterns that others can learn from. By paying attention to these clues, we can make more informed decisions when it comes to growing our own businesses. These clues can be anything from strategies that worked, challenges overcome, or even the mindset of successful entrepreneurs. Today's guest is Jeremy Torsk, the founder of Coaching Done Better. Jeremy has a wealth of experience when it comes to scaling small businesses, and he's here to share his insights on how to pay attention to the signs that success provides. So let's all give a heartfelt, charged up studio welcome to Mr. Jeremy Torsk with Coaching Done Better. Welcome, Jeremy. Oh, how cool with the applause there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I thought that's what you were doing was getting ready to put that little button <laughs> that says, you know, all the all the, uh, applause. Of the applause. Yes, yes. I've had a few people on that have done this. I don't know if you're familiar with who Rook is, Daniel Rook. And, I've heard of him. <laughs> yeah, and he is just hilarious. I've known him for 10 years, 10, 15 years. That's and great. Every well, time I have him on. Huh? Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, no. I'm looking forward to our talk here. I'm all about watching signs. I'm a strategist, okay? And as a strategist, I watch trends. I watch the market. I watch what the competition's doing. And it's important that small business owners understand why we need to keep our eyes and ears open. But we keep getting so involved in our businesses that we don't pay attention to what's going on around us. Yes, so before we get started, I always ask my guests one specific question to kind of break the ice, kind of give them a feel for who you are. So are you ready? Sure. Okay. If you were to go back and confront your younger self, what sage advice would you give him and at what age? Well, that's a good one. I had, uh, I've done a lot of work on myself. I came from a very troubled childhood. And so I had to write actually a letter to myself to, it's called, uh, you know, a letter to little Jeremy, actually. So uh, I, I basically wrote a letter to like my eight-year-old, nine-year-old self, uh, allowing myself to have fun and laugh and 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 not be so uptight because I was the, basically the patriarch of my family from about eight, seven, eight years old. And so I took everything so serious and uh, it was full of rage and always full of anxiety and and people thought that I was having fun because I was a drummer. I did play the drums from a very young age. I love jokes, love pe making people laugh. But our household was so inappropriate that what looked like fun was really just survival, just trying to fit in. Right. And um, it wasn't fun inside. And, and so it was full, so full of being responsible for my brother and sister and even my parents that um, it took its toll later in life in my later teens. So right. uh, I actually forgave myself um, a couple of years ago, I wrote that letter and just saying, yeah. you can have fun now and laugh. Yeah, I think we've talked about this on our last call, you know, and stuff like that. But it's it's funny how we can, our outer selves can camouflage or hide 
so yeah. much of our inner turmoil. Turmoil. And we're getting better at it because of social media, living yes. these alternate lifestyles and yes. then buying into it. When you're not there, you're not doing the work, you're putting right. yourself in front of these cars that you don't own and then you're buying into that your own hype and then you don't do anything in life and that's and and a lot of times we don't even realize it's going on yeah a lot of times we don't even realize those sabotaging behaviors that we are carrying out day after day after day that's that's (laughs) basically stopping us in our tracks and we can't understand why you know so yeah 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 so coaching you know i you can tell i've gotten a lot of out of my coaching my psychological you know, journey, yes. all of that. So, <laughs> and until you learn that, you can't you can't move farther. You know. So yeah. Well, that's why they say it's better to be consistently in the middle. Watch the highs, avoid the lows. You know, buying into that hype is kind of dangerous because, yeah. especially when you aren't near there, that those lows can be very treacherous when yeah. things hit. So, you know, staying right there in the middle. I, I'm not that way. I can tell people that I'm a very emotional person. Yeah. So working yeah. on that for me is always work trying to make maintain right. that middle, you know, right. 40 or 60 percent. Yeah, no, I have a daughter who was diagnosed with bipolar disease mm. when yeah. she was a teenager. But, you know, when I think back of it, she she's not on medication now. But when I think back on it, how much of it was a truly a mental disorder and how much of it was just typical teenage so, yeah, it's hard to tell these days, it's you know, especially when that set the onset of bipolar happens at those later teen years, too. Right. So, exactly. Uh, it's my mother was bipolar, which makes me always concerned Sorry. with yeah. the way my, my actions are. And I go, is this a manic, is this manic action or is this just me being, you know, t- my, my normal self, you know, kind of, uh, what's the word, uh, sensitive self, you know what I mean? Exactly. So, Exactly. And then you got to watch it. But I, the thing is, though, I do recognize it. Conscious of it. It's probably not the mental issue yeah. because I recognize it. And where, yeah. where that's where the, yeah. the manic people, they don't recognize it. The bipolar. And that's exactly it. You know, if, if you're conscious of it, you know, more than likely, it's just it's something that you're going Life. through. Yeah. It's triggering this, <laughs> you know. So so before we get before we dive into our discussion, Jeremy, can you tell our listeners a bit about yourself and your background in coaching and small business growth? Sure. So I have a lot more con- uh, experience in small gr- business growth, and I'm talking explosive small business growth. But when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, it's because I put in coaching type activities and actions that allowed people to do their jobs. So really, my coaching spans 20 years when you consider that small business growing time as myself coaching others around the country. Exactly. So I started off uh, literally digging ditches. At 20 years old, I was homeless, uh, and the book behind me right there is Labor to Leadership, My Journey from Pit Digger to CEO, because literally I was just digging ditches, but it was for a contractor for the cable company, and I ended up staying in that industry, in the cable television fiber optic industry for 30 years, and I went from a small construction company to internally, I worked for Comcast for eight years. Right. Uh, at 32 years old, I was probably the fastest promoted and youngest manager running an $80 million upgrade project down here in South Florida. And that lasted again for about eight years. So when I went out and left the company because that was over and they wanted to be, a, be some sort of uh, really, because I, again, that coaching, I did a great job with the contractors with that coaching mentality and ownership mentality. They wanted me to run their training departments, but I couldn't see myself. I talk about uh, teaching the ABCs of CATV. It would have driven me nuts. I'm just not built that way. Yeah. So I left, opened my own business as a contractor and did really great. That was in 2006 and blew up my own small business uh, just because I was an ultimate operator. I can get anything done. People knew that. They gave me the hardest jobs and I got them done. But in 2009, bam, and that housing market crashed. Housing market, yeah. I I was right in the middle of it. Right in the middle of it. I was in the architectural engineering construction market. I know so because I didn't graduate high school. I was homeless from 17 to 20. I didn't have a, a college degree. I didn't understand finance. I didn't understand sales or marketing or business or leadership. Uh, I understand operations and to some sort leadership because I was an example. I, I, if I walked it and talked it, people followed me. And so I guess from that, that sense where I understood mm-hmm. leadership, but not from a point of leading teams and, uh, and if they weren't having having a shovel in their hand or, or in a bucket truck, right. I didn't understand. 
So when I lost that business, I had no fallback. And I was, man, I was 600,000 in debt. I'd bought a new house. I'd, I'd leveraged myself to the eyeballs, buying equipment for the construction company. So we sent a homeless person on the street in 2010. They had $600,000 more than me because I had $0. I was in debt by 600,000, right? They had zero in their bank account. They were ahead, ahead of me. Yes. So it took three or four years for me to come out of that. And during that time, I had to humble myself I literally took a job answering phones at a call center, selling cable TV. And that's where my real PhD came in. And that's where I learned sales and marketing and real leadership of teams and building relationships. And really, uh, those, those four years, I, I have yeah. a tendency of being promoted very quickly. Yeah. So I was a director after like eight months. And I was opening up you know, offices in, in yeah. Jamaica and, and around and that's really what changed yeah. everything for me. So well, you would have been my, you would have been my ideal customer when you had that first business, because those are the people that I am working with are those that they, they have a good product or service. They do what they do well, but they don't know how to build a business around. Yeah. Brings. And so that's where, you know, that's where I come in with what I do through market. Yes. That's so, right. So I was talking because we, we kind of help. Yeah. People understand what they, they don't know what they don't know. That's you know? exactly it. That's uh, exactly once you it. can, if you have a gift of asking smart questions and having them realize their shortcomings, and then they can then ask you for that help. Uh, or, or you've illustrated enough times that you're the person that can help in those categories. Right. Uh, there's yeah. your value add right there. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So let's delve into our, our topic here. So what are some common signs that indicate small business is ready to scale up? So been this through is it. Perfect, <laughs> perfect timing because when I left that uh, market, that, that marketing job, the, my the, the home markets were coming back. Cable companies and phone companies are putting more money into the market of, of, of redoing their cable and fiber systems. Us, we were so new. I mean, we had no capital. We tried to get back into the business again. So I started it with the company and started building relationships with like AT&T and these large companies. Uh, we went to Dallas because Dallas was starting a big fiber optic project. So we didn't have a lot of capital to pay employees. So we hired subcontractors. So one of the things that when you say success leaves clues is if you can't afford it, sub it out, right? So the hardest thing about subbing it out was paying the subs in a timely manner. So what we did was we created a system of pictures of the plant that we were going to build. And we gave those to the subcontractors and the installers that we could hire. We built our plant so tight and so quickly that the AT&T inspectors, when they found out what we were doing, we, they made us duplicate that and got permission for us to teach the other contractors to do it. We actually changed the way AT&T did business in the Dallas market back in 2013 because we started you know, it typically takes two weeks to build a plant, 30 days to get paid. Contractors can't wait that long. We were getting paid 10 days after we built the plant. So we were able to put our contractors on a quick pay model because these pictures made everything easy. Build it like this. And we just made it in, literally in color, uh, like a four-year-old. And so we were able to attract the top subcontractors in the region to work for us because we paid faster than everyone else because the inspectors trusted us because we actually had the pictures of what we did. And so that really told us that even though we were new to the market in Dallas, we're all from South Florida. We went to Dallas where people worked for 20, 30 years with these built-in relationships. And we, with one simple initiative change, we changed the way we everyone did business over there. So the small guy can make a difference. And that was, that's the first time success left stuff. A huge clue. That's the way to do it. Um, no, I love what you're talking about there. And like I said, I spent 30 years in the architectural engineering and construction market. And while I was still working with one of the largest um, uh, construction management firms, uh, I got laid off in 2009. Mm -hmm. I saw the signs. You know, I saw us going from competing against maybe, you know, six different companies for one project it, over a 45 day period competing against 30, 40 different companies. That, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Just it changed that fast, you know? Yeah. And I kept telling them we need to make some changes, some cross training, you know, things are going to happen. 
yeah. to which you're going to have to lay people off, you know, those kind of things. And they were yeah. chasing projects, didn't have any relationships, anything like oh, that. Oh, all right. I guess started getting desperate. Yeah. Just so revenue. those are the kind of signs that we're talking about is let's, yeah. you know, let's look at this. You know, there's a reason things happen. You know, if you see your competition laying people off, okay, yeah. why? Right. Okay. Is it an internal issue or is it an external issue? Yeah. Is the, right. is the market yeah. changing or is the, that business owner going through some personal stuff? You know, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. So, you know, can you share some examples of um, uh, successful scaling strategies that sure. you've helped some, some of your clients with? Well, one of the things that helped to scale is just being, again, consistent and paying and doing what we we're going to say. Uh, and then actually getting it done in a way that when, we, when we're having problems getting our money from AT&T, we were able to work with the contractors and let them know that we might be late. So we let them, we gave them notice that the checks are going to be late because of whatever it was, but we could pay half of it now. So we were honest with them open and gave them time to adjust their finances. Right. Uh, and the biggest thing that that helped us out with, it became um, basically a trust issue. Where in 2017, when Maria and Irma hit Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, we had to go against the really big companies to try to get that project. I mean, that those are huge projects. There's four islands that were hit, two Category 5 hurricanes. Plenty of work to go around. But, you know, like you said, there's just hundreds of people going after it. We kind of made our weakness a strength. And by saying, the big companies that you're talking to are going to do all the easy work, and then they're going to come back to America when all the big easy money dries up and then no one's going to be coming over here to do the easy stuff or the harder stuff, especially the stuff that they messed up. And the people who live here, their houses are in disarray because it was devastated. They're not going to have the wherewithal and the mindset to come and do this work. If you hire us, we've got an army full of contractors that trust us. We're going to come here. We're going to stay here. We'll be here for a year. We won't leave until everything is done. We want all four islands, Puerto Rico and all four Virgin islands. We brought over 800 people in 300 trucks, and we stayed there exactly one year, and we got the whole job right. 95% done, except for some of the things where in Puerto Rico, there were some mountain areas that they just, we just, they weren't ready for us. But yeah. all the big areas and all, all four Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico were built because of that trust that came and started in Dallas back in 2013. Right. And right. it was because of that open communication. And when things didn't go right, we self uh kind of diagnosed what was going wrong. We communicated that and we worked around it. And that kind of boiled over into 2019 when that was done from 2000 all through 2018. Basically, we had nothing left in America because we had all of our resources now. All right, overseas, yeah. Overseas, so we come back to zero. Well. COVID kicks in. Facebook was <laughs> looking for contractors. <laughs> and they were doing this. A, a huge, huge project, 2 million feet through the hardest part of Eastern America, through the granite of the Appalachian Mountains, the Virginia wow. and West Virginia, 2 million feet, an eight inch hole this big in the mountain under the road. And the road in Virginia, West Virginia, very little, it's all two, two lanes and then ditches, right? So yeah. very, very tight quarters. I was going against Mostec and Diacom. We had 27 employees. Right, because we were all contractors. Those 27 employees were admin mostly, inspectors right. and supervisors, right. engineers, uh, draftsmen. I was going up against 15,000 employees of Mostec and DICOM to combine $19 million of, sorry, billion dollars in yearly revenue. Our biggest year ever was 60 million from the Virgin Islands. Right. Rico. I mean, that's a week for them. Uh, we won half of that project. It was a $180 million project. We won a million feet. So we won $90 million project within the first three months. And how'd we do it? We made our weakness, our strength. We yeah. said those companies, 180 million for them is nothing. Right. But for us, it would be a crown jewel. You would have all of our attention. We would be so, you know, uh, on time, we'd be, you know, present and we'd be right. asking what else we could do to make it your job easy easier where one thing goes wrong with them and you're chasing them yeah. we won half the project within three months they gave us both sides of that project they actually because took the other, they, off they the project. Behind. 
because they were falling behind. They were, they were not doing what we were doing, the things yeah. that we were doing. So we, they liked, again, our attention to detail, our as builds, and our, our telling them ahead of time when things were going to go wrong because we had that foresight and that communication skills where they were, they like to go after the fact, let's do the work, do the change order and get the money, even if it takes a long time because they have to pay us. Now mm -hmm. they could afford that. We couldn't. So we had to tell them ahead of time. We see black rock here. It's going to be this much money. We give them the foresight, the time to plan the budget. That $180 million turned into $300 million. And that's because, and we got all of it as we were going because we had that communication. So these are the little things where your weaknesses become your strengths because you see the success that those things from it and t and the successes from the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico did that led to the next bigger project. It was huge. And, and that's, and that is what's critical, you know, credibility and your word, you know, will stand out above anything else. Okay. And when you start talking about, you know, uh, it, like I said, you know, you saw Facebook and, and, and things like that, and you knew what was coming, what was coming down the road, you know, um, when I yeah. went into Brazil, okay. I was laid off in 2009 and I knew the entire world was going through this thing. It was not just the U S the only country coming out of this recession faster than anybody was Brazil. And that's because they were a cash country and it's because they had just won the awards for both the, the, the uh, World Cup games and the Summer Olympics. Oh. So coming from that industry, I knew the timetable. I knew everything was lined up for me yes. to go in there and match up companies. Those are the signs that you want to watch for. OK, what are some of the signs if you are with a company, either internally, internal signs is what I'm looking sure, at. Sure, I love that. What are some of the internal signs as an employee or something like that, that we should be watching for within the company that we're in that red flags should be coming? So out? I call that intrapreneur minded. Yeah. Uh, whenever, literally, when I was digging those ditches back when I was 20, I would come in in the morning and all the guys would be in the parking lot, and they'd be talking about how much they drank last night and how much they, you know, chasing the tail or whatever. I was, I went and swept the floors of the, of the warehouses just because I was thinking, I, I, it was my job, it was my company. I just treated every time that I had a position like I had ownership of that position, and I had a commitment to the company like I owned it. So, what you're talking about, the red flags, whatever position you were in, from sweeping the floors to being a C-suite person, it's not only the red flags. Yeah. The red flags is, I guess, it would be the opposite of what I was thinking you were going to ask me. Uh, are they not coming to me? Are, are they avoiding asking me questions? Because you'll oftentimes find the best person uh, in the in the department is asked to do the most, right? You do that so good. Why don't you do it three times as much? And then the person that's not doing it, we won't ask them to do anything. Right. Uh, that's a bad leadership uh, the overlay, right? When you have a bad leadership, that's exactly what happens. So if you're in that structure, uh, that's a red flag that you've got problems above you is that you're having employees who are good at their job being asked to do three times what they should be doing where other people skate. Nick um, Saban talked about the worst way uh, to ruin, a, a, or the, I should say the best way to ruin an organization is to mix high achievers and people that don't really have good uh, much care about the responsibility that they have. Right. They both right. don't mix. So a red flag is, do you have an organization that has a, a bad combination of really good achievers and people who are just mediocre minded? And that would, I would say, you have to work on that immediately. You can right. hire bad, you can't keep bad. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. And, and paying attention to who you're hiring. But internally, you know, you can, there are signs and, and you're right. I approached it from the side of say an employee or, you know, something like that. You approached it from the C-level. Okay. What's the C-level C with the people underneath them? Yeah. So there, there, there are signs internally that we should be watching that um, will help us determine, okay, are we on the right track or do, are there signs that we need to start thinking about? Do we need to pivot here? I'll tell you a good sign. Are there real true friendships in the organization at that level? When people, if you see people in an organization and they have friendships, they're hanging out after work on the weekends. And, and when they come in, they're talking about their personal lives in a good, positive way. They're interacting with each other and their families. You can't get better than that. When you have really good bonds between employees uh, outside right. of the office, that makes a real hard 
for people to leave your organization that way? So uh, how can business owners strike a balance between ambition and caution when scaling their business? I think it's by leading that way, right? You can, my last name is spelt to risk and my blood type is B positive, right? That's a bad mix. Right? That's, that's how come I, I have those highs and lows because I'm, I'm really a, up for taking huge risk. And then I have this big positive attitude that's all going to work out. Uh, but when it doesn't work out, it's that attitude. It's like, good, right? The Jocko willing get when it doesn't work out good. Oh my God, what is up next? Because that didn't work out for a reason. So when you have those ambitious people, push that, but watch the attitude for when things don't go their way. And when you have people who are too risk adverse down here, you want to prompt them. It's okay to take a risk and reward that, that behavior, especially when the attitude matches the, the outcome, no matter what the outcome is. That's very good. That's very good. No, definitely. Definitely. So what role does data and analytics play in identifying the success clues? That's a good question because I've often been, been called uh, Jeremy in the weeds Taurus because I go so deep with this analytics and it's not needed most of the time. I, in my position, I shouldn't have been doing what I did, but I created this rake off system that actually boosted us and our, our level of trust with AT&T because we would tell the owners of AT&T, our, 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 our counterparts, when we got a PO, I got so deep into their PO that I would tell them before we started work, we're missing these 82 line items that, that's going to be around $72,000. Can you add that to our PO before we start? Because they would actually get points deducted from their score if they had change orders after the work started. Yeah. So with our rake-off system, we actually made them look really good. So they would give us this PO, uh, inflated PO, before we started. It was good for them. Yeah. Now, I was the operations vice president. I shouldn't have been doing that. I was doing it every night after everyone went home. I was in Dallas. I lived in Fort Lauderdale, so I didn't have family. And I would spend hours and hours and hours going through the minutia of these numbers. I shouldn't have been doing that. Yeah. But once I learned that system, I taught somebody, an entry-level person who I could teach how to read them, and then they did them. And that was their job at $20 right. an hour, not me doing 90, 120 hours of a week. Yeah. When, uh, But somebody has to do it first. And once you yeah. do it first, then you can kind of keep it simple, keep a super simple system. But you got to do the minutia first because detail, the devil is in the details. But uh, just got, that, that balance is hard. And I love that you, work, too. Yeah. And, and, and you know, um, especially up until the recession of 2006, 2008, 9, or whatever, um, the AEC industry, the architectural engineering construction industry, really never had to really market themselves. Jobs were just put into their laps. Mm -hmm. okay? Very seldom did they have to compete because there was so much work. Yeah. Then when they ended up having to compete, then what you found is uh, a lot of these these uh, construction companies and things like that were basically buying projects. What mm. they were doing was they were low bidding and oh. with the understanding that through change orders, they'd make up the difference. The well, the owners caught on to that real quick. Yep. You know, so, you know, those are the kind of things. When you start seeing that happen and, and the low bids coming in, you know exactly what's happening. You know, and you're so talking to millions of dollars. So yeah. We're not talking a bid of thirteen hundred dollars a month. We're no. talking thirteen we're million talking dollars millions, a month. Millions, millions, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, and those little things help. Uh, they add up those little yeah. changes. Yeah. So we're gonna come to your your bailiwick here. So what role does effective coaching play in helping businesses recognize and act on the signs of success? So this is where my whole story changes. In 2021, after we got through uh, really doing a great job with that Virginia and Virginia, West Virginia Facebook job, company actually came in and bought us for a lot of money, like $35 million. Wow. Uh, I was a, an equity owner, so I got a nice chunk of that money. And it allowed me to just change my lifestyle. So I'm not, right. I'm not traveling anymore. I was traveling every single week for 10 years, building plant all over America, building these offices, hiring the people. That's where I was doing most of my coaching was just duplicating the McDonald's uh, system right around yeah. the country. And I was able to take that money 
and start this coaching program. And I started saying, I, what I see going on in, in this in industry, especially, is they don't understand that that model that you're talking about. Let's just go get in. We'll lose money at first, but then we'll get those change orders. And when these companies got smart, they simply just said, no, you committed to this. We put a penalty clause in it. So now we're going to start finding you every month until you get the job done. And these companies are growing out of business. And I wanted to help those companies. So I started doing this project manager mastery course, and I was helping a couple of companies. One of the things I'm most proud of is that I left that company what, two years ago. All of the people that I hired are still there. Yeah. And they're still doing great. And the projects are doing great. They're thriving. And because the systems that we put in were so good. These yeah. other companies, they're depending on the old guard, the old work. We've always done it this way. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of foundational stuff there, but there's certain things that you haven't changed to come around to that these bigger companies who are giving you the work, they're, right. they're smarter than that now. And they are, they're looking for somebody responsible who's going to give them a price they can actually do it for right. and do it for that price. Right. So we do like to help those that kind of industry. That's kind of where we uh, our mainstay is. But I, I definitely got tired quickly, though, because, again, started having to travel. I was speaking. I'm with the Florida Speakers Association. I wrote the book. And uh, I wanted to change that, too. Instead of me helping people, I created the platform where I got to have other coaches come to the platform and have the clients who are looking for those coaches find the coaches in one place. I created a depot. Because right. that's the problem I wanted to solve. I didn't want to help two or three companies. I wanted to help two or 300 coaches, help two or 3,000 companies. Right, right, exactly. You know, and in this industry, you know, um, some of the, uh, the outcomes of what they were going through is the um, influx or the rise of what we call design build delivery yeah. methods as opposed to design bid build. Because by the design build, then you're incorporating the architects into the actual whole process right? so that it eliminates a great deal of the change orders and, you know, and things like that. It's been incumbent know, so. upon the engineer who is going to do the work to capture exactly. everything. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So There's no that finger pointing. And, and, and the clients are the ones who are saying, I want design build because of this because of the fact that they don't want all these change orders coming through. Yeah. They want to know that I have a team that has worked together cohesively, you know, and to, to come in there. So. Well, there is an evil part of these companies who are still doing this. I know they were doing it when I left. I think some of them are still doing it. It's called the reverse bid. And did you ever hear of the reverse bid? Is that like, like the reverse mortgage? <laughs> it's worse than that. That let's say uh, AT and T did this once with their tree trimming project they had down here in South Florida. They had uh, twenty of us on a phone call, literally online, but it was a voice call. We weren't, we couldn't see each other, um, and we all put numbers in there. It was blind. They started the bidding at let's say it was two dollars a foot, and that's the starting bid, which is a really high bid for tree trimming. So we we're like, yeah, two bucks a foot. They go, okay, now the the lowest bid. Uh, we bid and then we got, well, how much we're going to come down six cents. We're going to go to a well, dollar 94. And then they would reveal everybody's bids, but not who bid them. And then we would all see, Oh, we were right there. And they would go, yeah, but that's not enough yet. Let's do it again. And it would drive us lower and lower and lower and lower. I think the winning bid was like 72 cents a yeah. foot. And it took all day. And yeah. it's like, you are asking for it. AT&T. You know, yeah. because this yeah. is such a bad way to do business. It's bad. It is. It's, it it's is. collusion, basically, at the end of the day. I mean, I've, I've, I've done bids, um, you know, uh, government bids and things like that on products and things like that. And and basically, that's what it, you've got a bid and they and they give you, they want you to give a range. Parameters. Well, how yeah. low will you go? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and then they go in they and they, they compete, you know, and, and yeah. but they don't consider those as intangibles too. Do we show up? Do we fix what we break? Do we leave yeah. with telling people that we broke, especially in yeah. our industry where you might cut, hit gas. And then if you don't tell anyone, it might blow a house up. You've seen those on the news around the country from time to time. Typically that's an underground construction company hits a gas line and the sewer line. The gas leaks into the sewer pipe, fills a, a pipe, a house up with their water and then it starts um, evaporating, and then they do a, a spark, and a house explodes. Yeah, that's happened more so many times. That's what you see. That's what's happened. Wow, wow. Yeah. 
So <laughs> in your experience, how important is having a clear and adaptable strategy when it comes to pursuing growth? Well, and strategy how do develop it. Yeah. Strategy comes down to systems and processes. So are your systems and processes in place? Are they system of company wide? Does everybody know about it? And do you review it at least on a quarterly basis? Yeah. So you're back to your point on data. What's working in the system? What's not working? How is the process effective? How is it wasting time? Does it work everywhere? Or do you have to change it or tweak it to some regions? So mm -hmm. when it comes to that, if you've got the systems and processes in place and you're reviewing it and it's being effectively implemented, then you're, you shouldn't have a problem. Everything should be going up. All your numbers should be going up. And if they're not, you should be able to clearly see why. There's those indicators. Success yeah. leaves clues. So does failures. Failures yeah. also leave clues. And that's true. That's true. But strategy is also being able to look ahead. What could happen? And yeah. putting together some kind of a mitigation strategy. If yeah. this happens, if this, then, what? If this <laughs> happens right. then this is what we're going to do. This is how yeah. we're going to pivot, you know. And that's and and that's critical when you are a small business, you know, moving forward. Look at what COVID did to a lot of these these. Who saw that coming? And we're not okay. talking small business. We're talking major corporations yeah. who hit hard. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, yeah. the the what if we used to call it what when, right? Because we'd say what would happen when this happens, or we so we just say what when. Tracy Colbuchini. I'm going to credit her with that. Yeah. Yeah. So she, yeah. she used to just say what when. And then we would have to say, well, when that happens, typically this would happen. Now everything is is going to be yeah. case by case basis. But over the large part, this is who you would call. This person's dealt with this situation before. You have subject matter experts uh, that are available to look at a project and say this this was something you might see. Now, most of the things you should know. Most of the things looking down, you have tactics and strategies. A lot of people mix those up or intertwine yeah. them or plate them. They're two different things. So on your strategies, uh, when things go wrong, it typically is because your tactics are out of line. So when you change your tactics, let's say um, uh, for construction, let's stay with that. We're doing underground construction. Well, you can see panholes around and, and different meters. You know, there's gas, there's water, electric, and communications, sewer. What you don't see is maybe an eight-inch water force main that's going through a neighborhood because there's no, uh, no clue that right. that's uh, evidence right. that that's there unless you've been there long enough and done enough jobs in that area to know, oh boy, I remember when I did the job back then, how it bit us, right. it bit us this time. So you don't know what you don't know. But when you have that understanding with the client that yeah. says we've identified everything we possibly can identify, we don't ask for change orders just willy nilly. We eat what we have to eat if we do mess up. But something like that, the unknown of the unknowns, you've got to come a little bit and help us with this part of it. And typically- right. You should have known. You're the. You, this is your home turf, right? Is, the, and that's right? exactly client, it. So. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, and you know, I agree. You know, you've got your tactical elements. You have your objectives. Okay. You know, you have your your goals, your objectives, and your tactical elements. Yeah. You know, and and in order to effectively, tactively, whatever is that a word? Tactively. It is now. It is now. I love it. In order to <laughs> apply those tactics, you have to understand what resources, everything else you're going to need. Yes. In order to effectively carry out tactively what needs to be done. All right. So there's so much more that goes into the strategy that is is really dependent on what your scaling process is. What's and the what outcome? What you want to do. Yeah. yeah. What is yeah. it that you want? So, yeah. you know, definitely. So um, are there any specific resources or books that you can recommend to our business owners? That oh, we'll talk to this? well, I mean, I have a couple behind me because those are special to me and, and uh, the author or the, or the licensees. But I would say uh, beyond, um, and they're out of focus because I love art, um, I, I love photography and I like the look of that. But, um, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is, is if you're a young person starting off, you definitely understand finances and how money works. Yeah. You're never going to get anywhere in life, no matter how good you are at anything, without knowing how money works, how capitalism works, how the real estate market works. So Rich Dad, Poor Dad, a big one. Um, it How to win and influence friends, uh, this, the seven habits of highly effective people, all of the classics. They, they're, they're there and they're classics for a reason. Um, meditations by uh, Marcus Aurelius Meditations. A lot of different people kind of translated his works. 
It's about how to be stoic and that's how to be uh, really how to take anything that comes at you adversity or otherwise like a, like, like would water off a duck's back. Right. right. It's, it's in my, the back seat of my car behind the passenger seat in the pocket. Cause whenever I'm stuck at a train or a drive through or something, and I got five minutes and I have to be patient, I whip that thing out and I just, I'm on, I'm on a highway and I'm sitting there. I can look at it and just open up to any page and just read. Cause this guy ruled a kingdom 2000 years ago. Right. And he had the same anxieties that we have about waking up in the morning and going to work and facing the plague and, you know, all this stuff. Oh, I mean, yeah. it's really amazing uh, what kind of person he was and how it his his mindset translates to us these days. No, definitely, definitely. So any last words or of advice you want to leave? You know, we, we started us off with success leaves clues. And I would just say that failure is a natural outcome. So many things are, are going to come to us in life and don't be afraid to try them because failing at something is a natural outcome. But, yeah succeeding and crossing that finish line when that happens you're only going to enjoy it for 10 seconds or maybe 10 minutes right it's that whole journey throughout that race uh the adversity the the blisters and, and the nauseousness and, and the, the your mind telling you to stop you idiot uh that when you overcome that and those things get get you get by it and that you have that elation that's the part that you have to hold on to. So to going through every day, getting over these little bumps every day, these adversities that you that you face. I mean, I have suicide in my family, like you wouldn't believe. I remember that stuff. I hold on to that stuff. Other than that, there are so many bad days I had that I couldn't even tell you the first place to start as to what they were. Because I don't remember them. They're just gone. Yeah. But it's a, it's a lesson it. learned. It's it a didn't lesson stop learned. me. It, didn't, yeah. it, it pushed me. Yeah. You know? And so take those failures and let them help you push you to, to succeed. Exactly. Those are the clues when you get past that. Mm -hmm. I, I heard something uh, I asked, you know, not to get religious, but I asked God for courageous of courage. And he gave me dangerous situations to be courageous. in. I asked him for wisdom and he gave me a, hard, a lot of hard problems to solve, you know? And so you, you're not going to get there by not being tested. And if you do, you won't appreciate it at all. But uh, yeah, and you're not going to get there by being placid either. You're not no. you know, by sitting back and waiting. You no, know, and that's I, the my, success that, that yeah. leads us to when you get past all that. Yeah. When I, when I, uh, I got a sister and, and when we were growing up and she was struggling and I, I said, why aren't you doing this? And why aren't you doing that? She says, God will get, God will lead me on the way. And I'm saying, mm -hmm. I won't lead you unless <laughs> you're willing to get out there and start doing stuff yourself. I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> I come from a hurricane South Florida, and there's an old uh, story about a hurricane flooding the area, and uh, the, the trucks came to the house to pick up the families. They said, God will save us, so they, everyone left but them, and then the water got higher, so he was on the second floor, and the boat came, and they said, get in, and he said, no, no, I'm sure God will save us, and so the water kept rising, and now he's on his roof, and a helicopter from the Coast Guard lowered a rope down, and he said, uh, get on. He said, no, no, God will save us. Well, the, it was the God all the moved. time. <laughs> they, they died. The guy went to heaven. He saw God. And he said, God, why didn't you save us? He goes, I sent you a truck. I sent you a boat. And I sent you a helicopter. What more do you want? I know. That's exactly <laughs> it. That's exactly it. You know, um, yeah, <laughs> I love it. I've heard that story before. And it's, it's, it really is. You know, when you, I talk about clues, yeah. Talk about signs. Come on, guys. You know, got to open your mind up bigger than yourself. That these, exactly these troubles are here for you. They're not happening to you. Exactly. So, how can people get a hold of you should they want to? Jeremy Torsk is my last name is spelled to risk anywhere on social media. I go live every day at two thirty on Monday through Thursday on all the social media's YouTube. Uh, like us, follow us, subscribe to us. Uh, basically, uh, Jeremy at Coaching Done Better. If you go to coachingdonebetter.com, my schedule is there. Jump on there. Let's grab a virtual coffee. I can help you introduce you to any kind of coach that you need. I probably, I'm not really coaching one-to-one -one anymore, but I've got the platform where I help people match up with the right coach for them at the right time, mind, body, or business. So, Excellent. And I will be including all of Jeremy's contact information in the transcripts once this podcast drops. Thank you. I appreciate you. Yes. So that concludes our podcast for today. Please leave a review on any of the streaming platforms you're listening to us on 
or go to our Charged Up Studio Facebook page and leave a review there. Charged Up Studio is the product of Marketatomy and Marketatomy Academy, the e-learning system designed specifically with the small business owner in mind. For more information and to register for any of our courses, go to Marketatomy, M-A-R-K-E-T-A-T-O-M-Y dot academy and sign up. Again, this is Dana Olivo, your host with Charged Up Studio. And we'll be back next week with another exciting guest. And thank you so much, Jeremy, for joining us today. And go out and have a Charged Up week. Goodbye, everybody. You've been listening to Charged Up Studio Live, the podcast with you, the small business owner in mind, with your host, Dana Olivo. Join us every Tuesday as we bring you valuable tips and insights into many of the topics you don't know you don't know about growing a successful business. Please leave us a review on any of the streaming platforms you are listening to or visit us on the YouTube or Facebook page and leave a review or subscribe so you don't miss another episode. You can also support us through Patreon by visiting our website, chargedupstudio.live, and click on the Patreon link. Until next week, go out and have a charged up week.